So what are the youths up to? My name is Naomi Wamboy Masharia and I'm at Strathmore University attending the 19th session of Beyond the Rules of Prestigious Initiative. And today we're going to discuss three of the SDGs. SDG 5, Gender Equality, SDG 13, Climate Action, and SDG 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institution. So sit back, relax, and join in as we learn about this. the conversations about gender roles, the conversations about um, uh, what it means to be a millennial with entitlement and privilege toward information to different perspectives, um, what that means in this world that we live in right now and how we are supposed to actually deal with all the things that come with that. Because um, it's easy for us to assume that it's simple, but then as we've seen through most of the cases that normally come up, um, in regards to social media violence of any kind, um, attacks that are usually, you know, tweets and all those things, it, it's clear that we do need to have more conversations about it. So um, I wrote a few um, talking points because I tried to be responsible. Um, radicalism, let's start there, because that's where people normally have a very hard time whenever they, they, they hear about tech violence or even whenever they hear about anything. Radical religion. What do you think of when you hear of that? Terrorism, isn't it? Yeah. When, when you hear about radicalism when it comes to religion, that's what you think about. When you hear of radicalism when it comes to even feminism, you think of sadist women probably like infringing the rights of men, you know? And at the end of the day, ultimately, we, I believe in humanity. So like, even when I believe in something, I have to recognize and call out the aspects of it that don't particularly befit the humanity aspect of it all. Because at the end of the day, people may be a lot of things. I don't know if you're allowed to cast. I hope I won't cast, because um, I find it cathodic. Um, but then, yeah, people can be a lot of things. People can be S, people can be F. But at the end of the day, people are all we have. And then I also have um, things to do with the whole expectation. What is expected? So um, I, I watch Vice from HBO. I love HBO, um, and one of the things that I loved most about Vice is that they tackle very different subject matter. General consensus, general um, generalizing anything is disgusting to me now. Um, I'm not saying it should be to you. I'm actually not here to attack anyone's beliefs, and if I do at any point, probably I'm joking, or at least try to believe I'm joking. Um, but generally, like that whole aspect of tackling subject matter that is not normally something that you talk about. Like, I remember they had one where they did this um, feature about this cult, which has their own Jesus. Some, I think, in Russia. It's actually in Russia, I don't think. I remember it's in Russia. And they have their Jesus-like creature, who is interesting because, um, and I say creature because I don't want to, like, assume what if he is. So um, it's a whole thing because... They go and they worship him, but then the, the, the interesting um, aspect of it that actually really caught my attention was the amount of reality the handmaid's tale that was actually happening there. Like the women, where their roles, what is expected of them and all that, it's quite disturbing. And it hit me that why is this not on CNN? Why is this not on BBC? Why aren't journalists actually going out there and looking for such kinds of stories. And I remember a lecture of mine when I was doing a third year course when I was a second year, because you can actually do that in private university entitlement and privilege, hello. Um, like, he told us this. He was like, you guys, you'll finish school and then you'll go out there and then you'll be like, I'm so driven and so special, your parents. And then it's difficult. You have rent. You need to have money. You need to figure out so many things at the same time, maybe even sexual orientation. And then it's a whole situation because now you don't know what to do. And then you end up succumbing to the norm, getting into th the traditional factor of anything. Where is that mula now, you know? Wanting to post um, about your pizza in and your 
what is chicken in and all that and it's lovely and i'm not saying there's anything wrong with that quite the contrary I actually keep posting because like for me my only whatever platform is whatsapp and like i get a lot of information from whatsapp stories so keep doing it so the thing about it though is that pressure now builds you into something that you are not and the expectation is what you succumb to without even realizing. Because the thing about gender roles that I find very interesting is, or even that whole we've empowered the girl child too much statement, which is um, I found very triggering, being a radical feminist, is that um, we are not really asking the difficult questions. What we are doing is just attacking an ideology that already exists. So when I, I knew that I'm going to sit in a panel that's going to discuss tech violence against girls and women, the first thing I told Sharon is, but I don't have a social media handle. Just like Ipele, I have not been on social media for about nine months now. It has nothing to do with me being harassed there. It just has everything to do with the choices with time that I was making on social media and a lot of burdens on issues that I was taking on social media and especially on Twitter. So when I thought about me not having uh, any social media presence and my role in ending tech violence against girls and women, one of the things that came to mind for me was tech violence starts offline. Violence against girls and women starts offline, and then it spills over to online. Because before you go and tweet that very nasty tweet, before you go and insult that girl on Facebook, before you go and insult that slay queen, because apparently, you know, it's so wrong to slay, you've thought about it offline. So it starts offline. And so I think for me, thing for me, how you how, how the youth are supposed to deal with tech violence against girls and, and women is first dealing with it offline and the effects will trickle down online. And on dealing with tech violence offline, violence against girls and women is for me a question of culture. It is the culture that is being perpetuated that is pushing forward violence. Uh, another, another thing I think we can do as youth in ending uh, tech violence against, against um, girls and women generally is to, to know, to seek. I think all of us here, everyone, not I think, I know everyone of us here can read. Everyone of us here knows where to look for tools that actually uh, enlighten us, for tools that actually uh, teach us on our rights as women, on our rights as men, on when you're using that, when you're using your Uber app, for example, what can a driver do and what can a driver not do? What signs do you look out for so that you can report? When in, in, a, in a partner, for example, in a romantic partner, a lot of people who abuse women are not strangers, true. They're not strangers. They are people you love. They are your family members. They're people you're working with. Those are the people who abuse us. So if we can get those tools, we can learn how to identify an abuser, then teach that to the girls around us and teach that to the girls back where we come from, to the girls in the schools we went to, empower those girls. I think that is another way that we can deal with tech violence. Um, anytime you want to apply for a job or any position or you want to vie for any leadership position or just anything basic, what do they look at? They look at your social media platforms, yeah? It's called your digital footprint. As much as some of us are not very much into the social media sphere, it is becoming a requirement that your digital footprint um, is, is linked to what you actually writing on your CV. It's, it's a requirement that whatever you say you're passionate about, whatever you write that you are passionate about, it needs to be displayed on your social media platforms. So that is how I joined Twitter, that is how I joined LinkedIn, that is how I joined Instagram, because then my thinking was I've, I'm done with school, I, I, I studied international relations and security studies with a minor in peace and conflict transformation, and the sphere in which I want to work in requires me to have a digital footprint that links to what I'm so passionate about that links to what I articulate anytime I'm given opportunity to speak. So that is how I joined. 
But then when you, jo when you attend many youth events, especially the ones led by other young people, they always discourage other Kenyans, especially the members of KOT, Kenyans on Twitter, not to be uh, keyboard warriors. But then when you ask these young people who are now organizing these youth events, how did you get to reach where you are? How did you manage to get to be able to organize this event? Through which resources, which connections? And they'll tell you, I wrote a letter. So in other words, they reached where they are to the means of the keyboard, right? So again, it's not about being a keyboard warrior or not. It's about making it meaningful, having meaningful keyboard skills and using it for a better good, yeah? So again, we need to look at it from a different perspective of, of the social media sphere. It's not just about showing off. It's becoming a requirement in the corporate world. It's becoming a requirement everywhere you go. But if I want to understand who you really are and, and to actually analyze the leg legitimacy of what you're saying and what you claim to be, I will check your social media or even your new media platforms, which include LinkedIn and blogging, yeah? So once again, uh, what, what, what is tech violence? Um, in my understanding, tech violence in relation to um, gender-based violence is using uh, digital pla platforms and digital devices, meaning smartphones and other platforms such as Gmail, uh, emails, uh, whether it's social media or new media, to, uh, to attack a woman or a girl or a man on the basis of their sexuality, on the basis of their body image, all right? It might involve leaking uh, nude images. It might involve simply, uh, um, what's the word? Stalking a person. It might involve anything that requires you to actually uh, um, expose them for the purposes of hurting them, whether it's hurting their feelings or hurting their image, which again shows how important this digital sphere is. Because if God forbid someone would post an image of me that I would not want it to be posted, it will definitely um, affect my image in the digital sphere. So here I am working hard to make sure that my digital footprint is on point, and there's this specific person who does not like me for a reason and decides to post funny pictures of me, nude pictures of me, stalk me on LinkedIn, stalk me on Facebook, stalk me on other platforms, pursuing me in, uh, and uh, making unwanted advances. To me, this is, this is tech violence against women and girls. It involves posting anything that would affect my livelihood, that will affect my peace of mind that will affect uh, and, and prevent me from actually progressing in these basic things such as just going for further education or just in my, in my um, interpersonal uh, relations, yeah? Have I made my uh, definition of tech violence clear in relation to gender-based violence? Yeah, so now that we've, I've made that clear, how do we solve this issue? One thing for sure, as much as we'll encourage the he for she movement, because there's a he for she movement whereby it encourages boys and men to actually also advocate for women's rights. Um, as much as there's this he for she movement, there is the Me Too movement, one thing for sure is as an international relations enthusiast, we have a government in place. Yeah? There are two things in international relations. Is that top-down approach of leadership and the bottom-up approach of leadership. Let me begin by speaking about the top-down approach. The top-down approach involves the leaders, the ones that we've elected to be our leaders. They're the ones who actually put in the necessary instruments, legal instruments and practical uh, legalities of how to actually solve this gender-based violence and the, the use of tech to actually um, uh, implement this gender-based violence. First things first, there needs to be enough laws that speak against it. There needs to be enough practical, practical ways of addressing it. Meaning that if someone will post a nude picture of anyone, there should be a, um, repercussions to it and very serious repercussions to it because at the end of it all, we are humans. 
Yeah? And we need leaders. Let me tell you, we need leaders. Because without leadership, we'll just go haywire. So that is why we need leaders. And according to the social contract, our leaders are there to serve us. Yeah? So again, they are there to serve us, meaning that they should be the ones to ensure that the necessary uh, uh, things is done to ensure that repercussions are there for those who use uh, uh, technology to implement gender-based violence. But then at the end of it all, let's be very realistic. Here in Kenya, there is such a generational gap between young people and our leaders because most of them are not young. Yeah? So how, how, will they be in, how will they be fully informed that this is what is going on in the digital sphere amongst young people? We have to inform them. We have to inform them, and that is where we, need, we continuously need to be keyboard warriors. But now we need to be more meaningful about it. You don't just go and post nonsense and retweet nonsense and expect that at the end of it all, my voice is being heard. So I'll just start with, um, today morning I was talking with a friend of mine and um, she told me about how uh, she was stalked by someone in her youth. Uh, by in her youth I mean she was in high school. And uh, there was someone stalking her. <laughs> there was someone stalking her and um, the, the parent decided, you know what, uh, I think it's about time I uh, took away your phone because I don't think this is appropriate. And uh, immediately my mind was like, oh, yeah, these guys are right. One in five women in developing countries do deem that social media is inappropriate for them. This is a developing country. Think about developed countries, how are women affected. Then it takes into account that, um, I'll give you another astonishing thing. 65% of women who have experienced this kind of gender-based violence uh, through social media platforms and etc., choose not to report such matters. Why? They do not have faith in the legal system. They do not have faith in these websites. What will they do for them? They believe nothing will happen. Um, looking into Kenya, in, it's astonishing that women's rights were not the forefront when it came to the development agenda. In 1985, when the UN Conference for Women was held in Nairobi, is when they thought, wow, women exist. I say it's about time we include them. <laughs> what? <laughs> we've been here. So what do you think we've been doing? Uh, advertising ourselves? Are we billboards? No, we're not. So um, when I read about this, I was thinking to myself, so uh, this is how FIDA came up, the Federation of Women Lawyers. This is how um, the Coalition on Violence Against Women came up. And it's quite amazing that the work they're doing from getting pro bono lawyers, from um, educating the community. Now, um, as Chelsea had said, it's important that we pick out on our boys. You know, for me, I hang out with guys. I think my dressing sometimes betrays me. <laughs> I hang out with guys, and they're usually like, ooh, hey, what's it? Tabu, just cheeky kiasi, cheeky kiasi on the left. <laughs> and you know, you're not supposed to, you know, um, you're not supposed to look Kwanza when a fine shot is passing by, so you're like. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, um, such things, that they're harmless, they're harmless. But then things get serious when boys are like, by the udem, I mean, piss off. By the way, the sex tape we made recently, hey, let me show you what went down. So, this is a kind of sexual harassment, people. It's, it's all fun and games until someone gets um, all heartful, cheerful on Instagram and you're like, damn, this is what I've done. But um, when it comes to solutions, you'll see UN Women has decided to, um, it's, it does not only empower the girl child, it does not only look at women. It goes on to uh, partner with incentives like um, partner for prevention, and this um, tries to educate young men as to gender-based violence. Um, let's take, for example, in Pakistan, they have a uh, hashtag bites. This um, speaks to women, um, they encourage young girls, women out there, to speak as to their stories in, on, based on gender-based violence. Um, in Kenya, I, I don't know if there are any hashtags on that. Um, I don't know if my panelists know about this, if there are any hashtags. Ah, we, have no, we know of none. Our legal framework is just the same. I think the most that um, tackles cyber 
crime is Kenya Information and uh, yeah, Kenya Information and Communications Act. And quite frankly, the most it does is criminalize some basic things like um, do not post obscene images, etc. It does not tackle cyberbullying. It does not look to that vulnerable girl child, that slave queen out there, that boy child who's you know stunting. Because this covers everyone. It does not cover only the women, girls, or whatever. Anyway, when it comes to solutions, it's very simple. Start with the people you're around with. All right, so um, the first question in regards to whether uh, social media dilutes our, our power yeah, in, in the offline. Um, rather, I don't think it, it does not dilute, but rather we don't understand the power that it gives us. We don't understand how best to use it. Um, for instance, I have for instance I have gained a lot from from social media. I have been offered jobs. I've been offered jobs through social media. Um, fortunately, I have never been attacked via social media. But then the thing is this: we do not understand how best to use the social media for our own. Um, development for our own benefit. People only think social media is there for fun. If you only see it for fun, it's okay to have fun, but if you never see how it's a tool for advocacy, then you will never use it. Yeah? As much as it's true that most of us, uh, we hide behind the social, me social media, the reason why most Kenyans hide behind it and they post all sorts of nonsense believing and trusting that there'll be no repercussions is because there are no repercussions. Yeah? There are no repercussions anywhere. You know, at times I just uh, drift through, swift through, uh, drift through the social Twitter and stuff, and I see all sorts of ridiculous things that are posted, um, insults that are hurled to, towards people, and no one tells, no, there's no organ that is there to actually uh, uh, punish the individuals. So in my opinion, the same way Kuna, this program called Fashion Police, we need to have a social media police. Yeah? Because then only after that, when there is, when there is some sense of, of regulations of what you can post and what you cannot post, then people will understand that, oh, there's actually a format of how to use these platforms. They'll, they'll understand that, oh, this thing is actually a powerful tool if you use it appropriately. Yeah? So does it dilute our power? I don't think it dilutes our power. Rather, we don't understand how to use it. We have not fully understand how it, it's, its magnitude, the magnitude of its, of its power. So because of that, we hide behind it. And again, there is no social media police. So we keep on posting whatever nonsense you want to post and move on with it. And whoever gets hurt will get hurt. And, th and that would be it, unfortunately. Hi, all right. So to answer the first question, does social media dilute the kind of effect we have on the ground? To some extent, I think it does. And how I think that it dilutes the effect we have is when people start talking about what she referred to as nonsense. So when, when uh, diverting... What, is, what exactly needs to be addressed by certain posts on social media. And a lot of um, things might have changed in the last nine months that I have not been there. But from what I used to see a lot on Twitter, sorry, on Twitter, for example, would, would be a woman saying, this is what happened to me. This and this was done to me uh, by a man. And some man from somewhere just comes up and be like, oh, yeah, it also happens to men. I think human beings generally, you need to stop that. If you are doing that, that is dilution. It does dilute the message. When I come here and post that I have been assaulted by an, by an Uber driver, I'm not here to solicit information on what other men have been assaulted by Uber drivers. Do not... Do not, do not dilute it by taking it away from the woman who's been assaulted. Here we're focusing on gender violence against women and saying, Ati, even my friend, Sju, who's a gentleman, who's a very strong buff man, was also uh, assaulted. So I guess it just happens. Don't do that. That's how you dilute it. So as, 
Um, another way in which there's, there's a movement called Take Back the Tech, something like that. Take Back the Tech, where you're using social media then to empower girls. So as much as some people can use social media to dilute, I do see that social media is a tool that a lot of the youth, Kipele and I might not have it, but to be truly honest, a lot of people our age do have, do have access to social media accounts. So that's a tool, that's one of the tools where you can easily reach a lot of young people. So you can use that to be able to, 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 to change conversations or track conversations in the way of getting laws, as she said, or in the way of making making sure we stay in, in a, we stay talking about the matter at hand. So how you dilute it is by trying to take the matter away. So when you, you're typing something and you feel like uh, this is probably not, think about it. As she said, think, do not post nonsense. Think about some things before you post them. Uh, sex education. I think one of the things that is that that, that enhances the perpetration of, of uh, uh, gender-based violence is the objectification of women. There are men who will see the female boob as an object, as an object that I can look at and say, I don't like it, it could be bigger, it could be smaller, it could, I mean, be dressed in a bra. Why are, we, are you showing that nipple? So when you are objectifying women, that is, that is where, that is one of the roots of violence. So with sex education, when children are taught in schools that, hey, it's a boob. They called it in biology the mammary gland. Was it was it that? Hey, it's a mammary gland. So that young boy won't look at it and be like, oh, I can talk shit about it because I think it's not as big as it should be. Or he won't he won't meet with a woman without a bra and a nipple showing and feel the need to stop her and ask her, why don't you have a bra? I've had that done to me in school, in uni, by a grown-up man, and sometimes it beats you, cause cause then how do you even, if someone stops him, like, hi, how Java bra? That's, that's what he said to me. And I was like, yeah, new quail. And you know, and, 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 and it's because this man sees, I don't know, the boob as something very sexual. You know, it's a fetish. How dare you show us that as you walk? So them teaching sex, sexual education, sorry. I don't know if, if it starts, um, the age, the age where it can start, I, I really, kindergarten, I think it would be too young, but as she said, early teen, yeah, that would, that would help. Okay, um, so I've been asked to be brief, I'll be really quick about it. Um, social media, they're leaching the message. I'll give an example of um, the university I was in, Daystar. When we guys had the strike, um, we had two. But I remember the first one prominently because um, it was the first time that I actually experienced people really not having faith in anything um, because um, it started as merely something that, because guys were like, we, we have to meet at the PSC. If, if you know, you know. So we went to the PSC because of like amazing Wi-Fi coverage and everything. And I remember guys had, um, what are they called, the masking tapes the white masking tapes on them, and then guys were there taking selfies with the masking tapes and everything and po posting a lot of um, information. What happens is um, there's always going to be traffic of information anywhere. Like, it's like Netflix. There's so much content, you just have to be specific to what is geared towards you. The thing about it is nonsense can easily be the headline of something that was supposed to be really important and that's where the dilution happens and that's where it's risky. I think it's just in knowing the poignancy of time. Like just being able to dictate that this is not the time for me to actually take a selfie but this is really the time for me to actually be posting if it's like maybe the condition of the hostels, to post photos of maybe the condition of the classrooms, the lack of projectors and all those other things that we actually want to be, you know, taken into consideration as part of why we are actually trying to advocate for this movement altogether. So I feel like that example for me like really spoke miles as to how it can be very simple for people to achieve a lot but at the same time so many drawbacks, so many setbacks come in because of the inability to dictate that this is actually the time for this. And um, the thing about it is that social media has power 
keyboard warriors and all these other things that normally come about. I'll get into that when I talk about the government and the generational gap, which is what I think is mostly the problem. Um, but all these things have power. So the moment you sit behind your social, your, your phone screen and your um, Mac or whatever and your laptop and you actually type up something that is violent, that's just on your farm. Like, we'd like to shoulder the burden of responsibility, and that's what people normally do, and accuse millennials of it, and accuse, I don't know, whoever of it, and accuse girls of it. But at the end of the day, I feel like it's important for us to be able to distinguish an individual from a group so that we can be able to actually take care of issues. Otherwise, people who also, like, are prone to accuse, uh, accusing um, people of an entire group because of a certain person's and individual's actions, I think that's just really sad.